Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bracewell webinar, Surviving and Thriving in a Hostile Cyber Environment. I'm very pleased today to be joined by two guests. Um, first, we have Seth Ducharme, who's a partner in our New York office. Seth was chief of the National Security and Cyber Crimes Office in the Eastern District of New York. Um, he moved from that to the interim U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of New York, but also over his long career with the Department of Justice, he served as the Principal Associate Deputy General in the Department of Justice. And so we're very pleased to have Seth and his insights today. We're also joined by Tom Hoffman. Tom is a Senior Vice President of Intelligence at Flashpoint. Flashpoint is a commercial intelligence vendor. Um, Tom has been there for about six years. And prior to that, among other things, Tom served as a cryptologic officer for the United States Navy. So he's able to bring his experiences uh, working in those environments uh, to, to bear today to help clients out in the world deal with cyber issues. And so, and of course, my name is Kevin Collins and I'm a partner in our Austin office. And uh, among other things, I was an assistant U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of Texas. So we're going to start, Seth, first off with sort of defining some terms and what we want to talk about. We've got one of those broad titles, you know, but but I think we want to zero in on a particular sector, or particular in, uh, industry. Um, you know, let's define the energy sector for our audience today. Yeah, ha happy to talk about that. Thanks, Kevin and Tom. It's uh, good to see you again. Yeah, I, I think, um, look, First, it's been well established that every industry, every sector, I think, uh, faces potential uh, challenges. You know, in the in the in cyberspace, no one is immune from attack, unfortunately. But the energy sector, in particular, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, can be an appealing target uh, for bad actors. And and by the energy sector, really, what we're talking about: uh, oil, gas, electric, nuclear, solar, wind. You know, the the way we create. Uh, power uh, for our country, uh, for our uh, domestic uh, customers, um, everywhere, you know, upstream, midstream, downstream. These are concepts that will be familiar to many of our, our audience members today. But, but we're really just talking about how power is generated, transmitted, uh, distributed uh, through that network. And unfortunately, every player in that supply chain um, can be an appealing target uh, for different reasons to cyber to cyber actors. Yeah, and Tom, let's let's ask you what what makes the energy sector such a desirable or appealing target if you're a crypto bad guy. Yeah, the the uh, crypto bad guys uh, they're out there and they're keeping us all uh, up late at night every night. Uh, as Seth highlighted, it's really the importance that this industry has on everyday life. And it's also what brings uh, all sorts of actors really into this. And uh, we deal with criminals who are looking to, they think there's a payday here if they can uh, gain access into someone's networks. Uh, we have seen ideological groups like eco-terrorists where uh, for uh, ideological purposes, they are targeting this industry. And then you also have nation states involved here, where when you think about uh, traditional war uh, making, th this is one where taking out an, the energy is one of the first things that you see a lot of militaries go after. Uh, and in that sense, you see that there is a lot of uh, state-sponsored activity and we've seen this not always uh, here in the U.S., but definitely in the Middle East. We've seen some of the biggest attacks against uh, the Iranians and their nuclear program. We've seen attacks against Saudi Aramco, both uh, wiping out all their networks, but then also just recently a lot of data was stolen and, and posted to the dark web. So it really runs the gamut of the types of actors who are really using cyber to really achieve their objectives. And uh, as we go through here today, I hope to uh, shed some light onto how each of these actors operate and, and show some of those tools with, with uh, how they conduct their operations. Yeah, Tom, thank you. You mentioned the dark web, and I know that's part of what we're going to talk about today. But before we move in that direction, Seth, you know, Tom identified sort of a national security element to all this. And I know given your background, you know, especially in the Department of Justice, that's something you understand. Well, you know, what, if anything, can you share? with our audience with, from a national security perspective? 
Yeah. You know, Kevin, I, th- I think when people talk about national security, you know, sometimes the first thing they think about uh, is what we, you know, refer to as critical infrastructure, right? And, and the energy sector is certainly a part of that. And so, you know, there's a concern about both the information and operational sides of the way our infrastructure operates. Um, so, you know, the, the scariest idea, I think, of a national security threat to critical infrastructure might be uh, shutting down, speeding up, or, or, or redirecting, you know, the flow of, uh, of oil um, or causing a, an incident in a nuclear reactor, right? I mean, these are the kinds of things they make movies about to keep us up at, at night. But we shouldn't forget that, you know, our national security depends on the resilience and reliability of our economy. And so, you know, while, yeah, the nuclear power plant is probably the worst case scenario, when our economy uh, is, is paralyzed even temporarily or when it's chilled by a perception or a misperception, you know, that our stuff or our money or our information is at risk, I mean, that is a national security threat. You know, if people are afraid um, to move freely in the economy, to spend money, save money, store, you know, take pictures, take vacations, store their things on the cloud, be secure in, in, in their in their personal effects, that is a threat to our national security because it, it keeps people home in their actual or virtual basements. So I think we need to think very broadly about what constitutes a, nas- a national security threat. Um, and unfortunately, cyber is an instrumentality. Uh, that can cause, you know, the gravest national security threats potentially if, if a vulnerability exists, or it can just be a long term uh, campaign of nuisance, you know, that has a chilling effect on our economy. And that unfortunately has has national security implications. You know, I, I think about the colonial pipeline incident that we had this year, you know, from the Department of Justice's perspective, or perhaps some other you know, agencies within the government, you know, how interested are they in trying to prevent these supply shocks? And do you see, you know, more regulation coming, more, more things that you got to, you got to be able to demonstrate to the government that you're doing to sort of prevent those kinds of national supply shocks, for example, in our energy sector? Yeah. I mean, the government has signaled repeatedly, especially since Colonial Pipeline, uh, that it's, you know, paying attention across branches, uh, the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, the SEC, um, the U.S. government is looking more closely at uh, corporations and how they, how their internal controls function, uh, what they're reporting to the markets about their cybersecurity, how they're working cooperatively uh, with the government. Um, I think, you know, tellingly, some of the government's initial messaging following Colonial was, you know, uh, a bit modest, right? It was, we can't save you every time, but we're going to try. We have our own um, uh, concerns, you know, on the inside of the U.S. government, you know, that we need to clean up uh, before we perhaps start wagging a finger at at everyone else. Um, uh, But I I think the messages are consistent and clear that across government agencies, uh, there is heightened scrutiny on on how you know we in the private sector protect ourselves and therefore you know f- form a more resilient uh, economy and more resilient uh, infrastructure, uh, which is in the government's interest to police that, incentivize that, and deter you know, everything from, from negligence to willful misconduct in cybersecurity. So, you know, the government wants to help. The government can't always help. It recognizes that, um, you know, Tom's old, uh, job in the military, um, you know, he could speak, certainly speak better to that than I can, but, you know, there's things the government, you know, can do very effectively in cyberspace. And there's certain things that the government really just has to be the messenger to the private sector and say, you know, get your house in order. Uh, now, um, because right. consequences are coming. If, if not, if not from the cyber criminals, then there are going to be government consequences, regulatory or otherwise. Right. Well, let's let's talk in detail a little bit, Tom, about you know just an overview of of what some of these cyber attacks look like. 
Uh, I know your company in particular has some specialties, specialty areas, uh, but why don't you, for our listeners, sort of just describe some of these cyber attacks? Uh, yeah, it's a very complicated question. Um, at, however, there are it, all attacks in cyber. They really follow a, a very standard process. Uh, the first thing really comes down where uh, whoever the attacker is, they do some basic reconnaissance. What's very interesting, and I can show you some of this in a little bit, a lot of the, the tools that are being used to identify vulnerable systems, expose servers, uh, what, what your uh, what's publicly available on your network, these are tools that are uh, readily available and they scan the internet all the time. So this is what's happening nonstop in the background is this reconnaissance phase where uh, potential attackers, they are looking for uh, any vulnerability. If you don't have a, a patch uh, deployed very quickly, uh, these robots are just out looking nonstop for that initial foothold. Uh, once these um, these tools identify a potential vulnerability, they've even automated how you go about exploiting it. So now uh, the, the first thing that happens quite often is uh, once a, a system is identified, sometimes it's a misconfiguration, sometimes it's a, a vulnerability in the software that's running, uh, or it could be uh, someone's username and password were stolen. Uh, these, um, this is really the first step, uh, in, in which these attacks occur. Uh, we call these the, um, the, the account access brokers where they're selling access into different people's, uh, networks. Once you have that initial, uh, access or foothold in someone's network, it's a lot of times very easy to move uh, laterally through a network and what these, especially the ransomware actors are doing in as little as four hours. We we've, we've seen some of the more advanced groups take over an entire network and lock the entire thing up. And that is really just what we're dealing with is the speed in which this is happening, the automation that's behind a lot of how these attacks are occurring. And now the consequences, once they have stolen information from your network, They've locked it up. You can't access any of your resources. And then they start demanding multiple millions of dollars in some cases to uh, obtain access or recover your network. And this is putting a lot of companies um, and across all sectors into really difficult positions where they never thought they would be working through or contemplating a payment to a criminal syndicate. And this is one where it brings us here today because it really brings in a a uh, whole slew of other factors in which companies are really dealing with, not only from the legal perspective of making a payment to a criminal enterprise, uh, but then also just the, the as Seth was talking about, some of these impacts, they have huge implications that Im impact our daily lives. And it, unfortunately, it's occurring more and more often. And uh, th this is one where, unfortunately, it's getting easier for these attackers to conduct all these and you don't even need to be technical anymore to uh, conduct these attacks because the uh, the tools are out there and they've automated a lot of the aspects of how you want to uh, conduct these types of attacks. Yeah. And I, and I know that you're going to take us out to the dark web and show us maybe these, you know, access uh, account access brokerages. But before you do that, you know, you mentioned you don't even have to be technical anymore to execute a, a ransomware um, why don't we describe for our audience sort of ransomware as a service, you know, and, you know, I think our audience is sophisticated enough to recognize that probably for many of them, they get Office 365 now just downloaded from the cloud. So why don't you sort of help our audience understand what's what what's taking place in the ransomware world? Yeah, um, well, I think it first starts with the criminal underground, the, the criminal enterprises that are operating are extremely sophisticated. And we always talk about from a, a business operations, these are some of the best run businesses in the world. Uh, they are hugely efficient. They are very focused in what they're doing. And the criminals, uh, what the especially in the Eastern European criminal community, they've really broken up every stage of how you conduct an attack from uh, developing exploits or running a botnet to send spam emails to... Uh, how you steal credentials off of someone's machine, all the way to what I was talking about earlier with how you actually deploy ransomware on someone's network once you have that initial access. Uh, so the, every part of this attack sequence has been really broken down where you can go and and become a part of one of these syndicates 
and you can rent out the entire infrastructure from that initial access all the way to uh, conducting the ransom to even they've outsourced the negotiations where you can become part of just the negotiating process where you deal with the victims and what they're going to end up paying. And this is one where the affiliate model has become very lucrative for a lot of the, the criminal enterprises because it's very similar to a McDonald's enterprise. You can rent out the, the McDonald, McDonald's franchise. You can get the infrastructure. You can get the know-how. You can get the technical support. And what you owe back is a, a portion of your proceeds from all these illicit activities. Uh, so this is uh, the, the Colonial Pipeline they fell to a group called Darkside, and that was one of the affiliate programs, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, even from the, the folks like Flashpoint, you don't always know who's on the other end because uh, we, we've seen some of the affiliates. They're very nice. They're cordial. They want to help you get your systems back. Uh, but then you deal with a, another affiliate from the same group, and they can be very confrontational, very combative, very rude. Uh, so it really just complicates everything um, when you're when you're dealing with these groups. Uh, but one, they're proliferating. Um, the the model like this started about two and a half years ago uh, with one major group, and now we're tracking thirty different groups that are operating at, at this level with the affiliate model. So it's uh, really quite a, a dangerous ecosystem. And unfortunately, the amount of money that they're making is attracting more and more. Uh, applicants to join their their criminal enterprise. So these affiliates, where where are they typically based internationally? Do do you have a sense? Does your intelligence gathering systems at Flashpoint give us a sense of where most of these folks are located? Yeah, it, it's the countries that provide safe havens for these groups to operate. It's pretty clear. It's uh, uh, a lot of the former. Uh, Soviet bloc states, uh, how the malware operates, uh, it, it specifically excludes going after uh, certain former Soviet states. Uh, we know um, that there's um, within the, the forms in which we operate, there are certain unwritten rules where uh, it's Russian speakers are embraced. Um, so they really a lot of the innovation is coming out of the Eastern European space, uh, in particular Russia. Uh, but it's not only that. We know North Korea uh, has gotten into this game. We know that there are Iranian elements who have been doing this, and they've been conducting attacks using ransomware as really a cover to go after Israeli entities. Uh, so this is what's happening, which is the proliferation of this uh, type of attack. It can be used for a lot of different aims. Uh, the criminal aspect of, of stealing money is the predominant one. But there are a lot of other ways in which uh, these could be false flag events for other entities who are trying to achieve some other objective, but using the criminal foil as as uh, or the the criminal attack sequence as a foil to hide their their true um, their their true identity. So um, that's a very long answer to say all the innovation is coming out of Eastern Europe. Most of these groups are out of Russia, uh, but as we look forward, we expect to see that really spread more and more across the, across the globe. Yeah. You, you know, you mentioned North Korea and Iran. I, I didn't hear you mention China yet, but it, it seems to me that there's a difference and you know, you've said it, there's, there are state actors and there are criminal actors, but maybe some of these criminal actors from some of these other geographic locations are just a cover for, you know, more of a national security issue that Seth was describing. Yeah, China is an interesting one. There are some uh, criminal groups who are using ransomware, uh, but we don't see it's very active. Uh, part of it, interestingly, comes back to, I think, cryptocurrencies, where uh, China has spent a lot of time um, keeping control about who can... Bitcoin is, is not allowed in China. That is the, uh, the predominant currency that's used to uh, fund a lot of these activities. And China has done a very good job at uh, really keeping the underground economy from flourishing. So it's really not a conducive environment there uh, where uh, just it, it may change. But as it stands now, uh, we don't see a lot of the, the Chinese actors where we see a lot of their activities. It still is the corporate espionage. It's looking to steal information, steal intellectual property. It's not necessarily looking to monetize these infections. And uh, one, I think it also goes back to even if they were able to extract a multi-million dollar Bitcoin payment, there's no way for them to monetize that. So uh, it, it is one where 
Um, it, it's something we watch. Um, but uh, I think North Korea and Iran and Russia, they're very comfortable working outside of the international system. And I think that's one of the reasons why that's where we see the predominance of these groups. You know, Seth, Tom mentioned sort of corporate espionage. I mean, when you, when you hear that, what are some of the tools in the toolkit to sort of combat that? You know, if you're advising a company, I mean, there's this risk of corporate, es- corporate espionage, particularly coming from an unknown criminal element. You know, does anything strike you as a, you know, a tool in the toolbox that they could use to sort of help them? Yeah, sure. And, 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 you know, it's funny when we stood up our, our national security and cybercrime section in, in the U S attorney's office, I think we did that around 2012. And uh, initially the types of cases that we looked at were just that they were the thefts of trade secrets, intellectual property, you know, things that could be taken and converted to the use of another and the value would be derived from that intellectual property, you know, somewhere down the road. Whereas what, what Thomas pointed out is, is now they're just cutting right to the right to the value. You know, it, it doesn't matter how much your IP is worth. Whatever you've got that's important to you is going to be worth money to you to get it back. So, so it's you know grabbing what 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 is dear to you and keeping it away from you. I think it's typically how ransomware works versus you know stealing you know, the company secrets. Mm-hmm. And fortunately, I don't think you really need different strategies, you know, to mitigate both types of attacks. I mean, you're, you're talking about basic, you know, good cyber hygiene and compartmentalized networks. So you keep the things that are valuable to you uh, behind layers of protection from not only outsiders, but I think in the, in the trade secrets area, from insiders as well. Um, f- for a long time, you know, the, the, the buzzword of the day was insider threat. And there was this notion that, you know, only the insiders with an inside view of the, you know, the company secrets and the networks could really walk those paths. We've learned the hard way, uh, that there's other ways, you know, to get to those, to get to those, those jewels than just having an insider. But if you want to preserve your ability, let's say to make a theft of a trade secrets claim, or even better foreclose the possibility that you're going to lose it at all. You treat the information, you know, the way we used to treat it, you know, back in the government uh, as compartmentalized and restricted access and behind layers and layers of security. And Tom could certainly speak better to what that means technologically, but conceptually it means, you know, you, you can't walk in the front door <laughs> you know, walk straight to the end of the hall, you know, open one door and there's the goods, you know, th- there are essentially need to be, uh, um, you know, hallways that do not lead, uh, to where those goods are kept. Uh, and those, you know, those, those secrets, trade secrets, those valuable things are essentially behind a series of locked doors and they're compartmentalized. And so if you imagine that as a, as a network or a website, you know, you're the things that, guests can log on to or the public can access on your website there should be no path from those places to where you keep your secrets um uh, and if if you do that whether your secret has true trade secret status you know as a legal matter uh whether it's you know tr- has true value a, a, as intellectual property or if it's just the thing that matters most to you, your customer list or, or something that you need to keep your business operating, it really doesn't matter. It's valuable to you. And so you need to put it behind layers of security and cart- compartmentalize it fr- from the channels and passages and pathways, you know, into your fort. Yeah. So, so Tom, like, like any good architect, Seth just designed the building, but you got to come up with the concrete, the steel and, you know, <laughs> Uh, the internal workings to make that building secure, you know, maybe if you can dip into a little bit of the sort of technical tools companies can employ in services and other vendors like you that they could use to to sort of help meet that conceptual security system that Seth described. Yeah, Seth did a, a great job there. Um, it, it really is the the layers of protection that you put in place that really just you just need to make it harder for these groups to uh, uh, to you don't want to make it easy. Um, and this is one where I always say it's the strong passwords. Like there is a reason you always say strong passwords and don't use the same password for uh, every single thing. 
Uh, and then when you talk about multi-factor authentication, just even your personal accounts, I strongly encourage everyone just employ the multi-factor authentication, whether it's sending you a text message to verify your account or you install a, a, an authenticator on your phone. Uh, those two simple steps will prevent 95% of attacks. And that is, is um, really what we're dealing with here. Uh, the other aspect is the patch management when there's new vulnerabilities. And this is something where enterprises have to take on. It's not easy. It's really complicated to, to have a really scaled uh, patch management program. Uh, but doing those basics will take care of most of the attacks. And I will share a screen here because I, I do want to show you uh, what happens when you don't do that. And what we're going to look at here is uh, two of the, the markets, the really uh, big markets right now, Russian market and Genesis, that have made it very easy to acquire access into people's machines. And it's the, the accounts that don't have those basics on there that are being used to facilitate a lot of these attacks that we're talking about here today. So what we are looking at here is one of the uh, predominant markets where you can go search for access into uh, individuals' machines or even into corporate enterprises. And how these uh, uh, these shops are sourcing all this information, it's malware that's being run on a lot of individual people's machines where if you if your kids download something on your home computer, well, what that malware is doing is it's stealing all this information and sending it back to the, the criminal actors or, or the, the cyber threat actors. And when they look to monetize this, they take all that information and they put it for sale and essentially an eBay for the, the criminal underground. And what we're looking at here is just how simple they make it. You can search by someone's IP. So if there's a specific organization in which you want to, to identify, you can type in an IP address. You can look by specific operating systems. Uh, if you have a specific exploit that you know works for someone running an unpatched uh, uh, version of, of Windows, you can search for uh, those machines. You can look by ISPs, by country, by states, um, whether the accounts have PayPal. And even an interesting thing over here, you can also search if the account uh, that you're searching for has admin privileges, so administrative privileges into the network. And when you look down here, uh, each one of these, uh, they're global and they are cheap. $10 to gain access into someone's uh, home computers. Uh, we can, uh, as we look through here, uh, we can see, um, so these, these are the RDP accesses. Uh, this is uh, when... No, hold, on, hold on a second. Oh, sorry. What's an RDP? Ah, so uh, the RDP is the Remote Desktop Protocol. It's when, think about when you're having issues with your computer at work and you call the IT desk and they say, let me remote in your computer and I'm going to take it over. How they do that is through a, a specific computer port. And it's typically not well defended. Uh, it is something that not many people think about. And it's actually where a lot of these groups are getting those initial accesses because typically you don't have the multi-factor authentication deployed. Typically there are reused passwords uh, or weak passwords and this is where a lot of those uh, botnets that we were talking about earlier, that's what they're just constantly trying different credentials over and over until they find the one that works. And then once they gain that access, they go to these shops and, and sell access. So what's interesting to me about the RDP stuff, it, it, it's not just inside your work environment, but I, you know, I've, I just used that the other day. I had a problem with the software on my home computer and, you know, the person who was solving that problem wanted access to my computer, I gave it to them. Uh, and then hopefully I got rid of it. But that's what you're talking about. It's letting somebody over the internet come in and fiddle with your computer to solve your problem. Yeah. And with the uh, af with COVID and with most people working from home, this is keeping a lot of organizations up late at night. Uh, what happens with your employees when they're at home on their home computers and they get infected with malware, but they have the ability to access your corporate networks? And this is actually, there's multiple cases where uh, some high profile events, that's exactly the pathway in which these actors, they went in through someone's personal account that had access, privileged access into a corporate enterprise. And it, it happened that quickly. And even down here, when we're looking at the Russian market, um, you, you have the ability where if you can see here, it's a little bit hard to see, but you, every account that someone has on their computer, 
they've stolen. And you can search for it. If you can search for specific domains up here, they've made it super simple uh, to identify accounts that as you $10, you, you can buy access into someone's networks and then deploy a million dollar uh, ransomware event. Like that's the, that's the uh, disparity we're, we're dealing with here, which is uh, some of the techniques being used are so simple, but the impacts are immense. Uh, I also want to show you another one, which I was talking about earlier, where you don't even have to be technical anymore. There's a very popular market called Genesis. Um, this uh, one allows you where you don't even have to understand how this works. Uh, there is a browser plugin uh, where you can install this. And once you install this, you can replicate someone's digital uh, profile and bypass most account checking mechanisms. So if think about when you log into your bank account and it says, I haven't seen you come from this computer before. Well, what the, the check is doing, it's looking for uh, what software is on your computer, what your browser version is. And what this shop here, Genesis, is doing is it's replicating all that because all that information has been stolen from your computer. And when you uh, want to go take over someone's accounts, you can go in here and you can search um, th these bots. Um, these are infections that they run worldwide. So you can go by specific regions. Uh, and then you can also go search where, again, each one of these, it's someone's personal identity. It's taken over their entire digital identity. Uh, if I were to purchase this one, you can see it's different prices depending upon how many accounts are associated with a particular account. Uh, but they run from a couple dollars up to a couple hundred dollars. And you can take over someone's email accounts with all their linked bank accounts. And once you're able to replicate their entire session, you're able to uh, siphon funds from their accounts. You can identify Bitcoin wallets that they might have and steal all the, all, all the data from there. You can conduct spam campaigns. Uh, so really, this is just how easy they have made it to uh, take over someone's digital identities. And the innovation around these shops, it, it's really quite impressive of how they've made it really so simple where you don't even have to have technical capabilities anymore to take over someone's digital identity. So just for the benefit of our audience, that's not tuning in on their computer. Maybe they're listening to us as they drive, you know, using this customized authentication software, you can just plug in and use as a bad guy. You know, I'm looking at somebody who now for sale for 30 bucks um, I can log into their Facebook, their Alibaba account, their LinkedIn account, the Apple Store, their WIX. Where they, I guess they made a web page at some point. They got a Groupon, uh, Vodafone. <laughs> you know, it, the list goes on. That's uh, that's remarkably scary. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's interesting though because here's this plugin that makes you think that you know, you're logging into your normal bank or something else. I mean, how do you, how do you avoid that as a consumer, as an employee? How do you know that this thing that you're, you know, trying to authenticate because you want to just hit your bank account or, or some other account, work account, how do you, how do you prevent that? Yeah. Um, th this is where we support a lot of companies with understanding uh, where you can look through these shops and identify employees. You can identify uh, different things that are being made available for sale and you can uh, proactively, uh, if your company has ever proactively reset your password, a lot of times it's because uh, something like this where uh, the, we, we've been able to identify that there was a vulnerability or someone's information has been stolen. And you can take some proactive uh, responses there to help uh, force password resets or you can put additional monitoring on uh, accounts. Uh, but some of this is also back to the multi-factor authentication. Um, if, even if someone had all this and you had multi-factor authentication on your Gmail account, it would still, it would make it, um, I, I don't want to say impossible. It makes it exceedingly difficult for someone to take it over this easily. And that's why we always say it's education about how um, this ecosystem operates. It's doing those basics when it comes to cyber hygiene. It's uh, being proactive in how you think about your organization, not only to pre protecting your organization and your employees, but then who has privileged access in your networks? Who are your key third-party uh, vendors who you depend upon to, to uh, keep your business operating? And we've seen that uh, more and more uh, you can get proactive as an organization with 
being um, proactively looking for these types of exposures. Once you see these exposures, you can take um, actions to uh, reset accounts. And uh, really what you're trying to do is just make it as hard as possible uh, for these groups to prevent them from uh, really moving this down that that attack chain that attack chain that we were talking about earlier, which is the scariest thing is if someone can gain access in your network and then they deploy ransomware, that's where I'll move over. If you ever well, hold in. on before you Oops, before sorry. we go into that new topic, I want to get Seth back into the discussion because you know I heard you Tom describe making sure you're covering the basics. You use the term education. You talked about using multi factor authentication. You know, Seth, you, you hear those terms, you know, for as a lawyer, you know, as a former prosecutor and as a lawyer, I think we probably think about, well, what's the standard of care, right? And, and can you sort of give some thought to, if you're advising in a, a company about what their legal risks are, uh, what are you telling them in light of all this? Yeah. You know, what I keep, what I keep thinking about is, you know, and, and all three of us have been in, you know, command centers of one kind or another during critical incidents, you know, when the bad thing happens and, you know, when the bad thing happens and let's say here it's a ransomware attack, you know, or a compromise on, on the network. The, if this is the first time that a company is, ex, is experiencing, you know, true, tr true threat, not just some activity on the network that's of concern and, you know, that's being handled, you know, maybe by the particular component, but there's a true threat, existential threat, you know, to, to the corporation, people are two things are going to happen. One, there's going to be a huge cry uh, for information from the decision makers, you know, in one form or another. You know, somebody who realizes that they're res ultimately responsible for this is going to say, "Somebody tell me what's going on," <laughs> right? And I think the reason that conversations like this are so important is because it primes, you know, your brain for that conversation. The more you can have this, you know, a conversation like this when there is no existential threat facing you, you know, the more you can prepare yourself to have that conversation when the threat is there. And, and so more directly to your question, Kevin, <laughs> the other thing that happens at the same time that people are saying, you know, what's going on, they're wondering, did we do something wrong? <laughs> is this our fault? And um, you know, people get defensive or, or they, they get uh, anxious, the communications start flying. Um, and so when you talk about things that really come down to, you know, look, basic cyber hygiene is basic, but it's, it's not easy, uh, because it requires hu human discipline and it's inconvenient. So when Tom says, yeah, come on, it's basic, you know, two-factor authentication, different passwords for different accounts, you know, long, complicated passwords, maybe using a password manager, those things are not complicated, but, you know, most people are going to groan because it's, it, it, it creates an inconvenience to the thing that they want. And as human beings, we're not great at delayed gratification. You know, we want the thing we want now and we want, and we want in, you know, we don't want to have to look at our smartphone, you know, to click, yes, that's me to, to, to get in. So part of it is just convincing people that these are habits worth forming on the front end. So when the bad thing happens, you can focus on what the real problem is. You know, you, you won't be, you won't be thinking like, like natural human response. Oh my God, you know, what should I have, what could I have done to prevent this bad thing that's unfolding right now? And worse, let me vent those anxious thoughts in real time on texts and emails and in phone calls that, that later are going to be used against me in litigation or going to make me, you know, look, look pretty bad when regulators or investigators come in to judge, as you said, Kevin, you know, what is the standard of care? By now, the standard of care is somewhat established. So, you know, when I first started doing cyber, like back in 2012, to be blunt, um, many people, you know, including myself who were coming into the space, were struggling with a steep learning curve to figure out what we could do and what we couldn't do and what was a reasonable standard. And, and that was, you know, to some degree forgiving to the victims. Everyone then was sympathetic to the victims in 2012. Oh my God, this terrible, unusual thing happened to you. You know, um, you know, I'm so sorry for you, but now <laughs> there is a standard of care. You know, it's it's 
inconvenient, but it's not that hard. You just have to make it a, a habit. You know, look, when we were all kids, not everybody put their seatbelt on, right? Because it was a, it was an inconvenience and it was, you know, you weren't that cool if you were riding around, you know, on the weekend with your seatbelt seat belt on. Now, pretty much everybody wears their seatbelt, you know? So I, it's, a, it's a little more complicated to implement the cyber hygiene, I think, and best practices that Tom's talking about, but, it, but it's akin to that. It's an inconvenient process at first that then becomes habit. Once the habit is in place, you're less likely to have the bad thing happen at all. And if the bad thing does happen, your first thought is, well, we took all reasonable precautions. And maybe that focuses us on the nature of what the threat actually is. Because when Tom uses statistics like, you know, 95% of attacks will be prevented by some set of reasonable habits and measures. Well, if you've implemented those measures, well, now you know you're dealing with, with the 5% exception. And that can inform you a, a bit about the na nature of the threat. So, you know, when Tom said also one of the network attacks he saw unfolded in four hours, you know, you think about that. If if that's a very short window to have an existential threat hit you. So the more your brain can be focused on, you know, what am I actually dealing with rather than speculating on the world of possibilities uh, and and possible errors and and, you know, what could we or should we have done? This is just a long way of saying, you know, if you take Tom's advice, you can be much more focused when the bad thing happens on trying to solve the problem. At least that would be my view. And you're also going to be much more forgiven um, by stakeholders, partners, regulators, investigators, if you have these measures in place uh, than if you don't. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> in listening to your answer, that that last point you made is what struck me was, if you employ what we consider to be the standard of care and you're eliminating 95% of bad actors because you're just blocking them, it gives you an argument to say, well, you know, we did everything we were supposed to do. This is a very sophisticated attack or this is in the top three, top 5%. I think that does give you an argument. I think what's hard and what some of our listeners hopefully are thinking about, you know, our chief information and security officers who might be listening to this or the lawyer in charge of compliance at a large organization, you know, they, they've got to build the safety case or the case rather for when they need to go to management and say, I need 5 million more dollars to do this or, you know, whatever the case is. And maybe that's when the standard moves from, you know, 12 or 16 digit passwords to biometrics, right? Like that to me is, is maybe what's on the horizon is how do we, you know, how do we help them build that business case? And, and I guess it's just monitoring, you know, just sort of continuing to see who these threat actors are and, and how they're getting in. And, and, and it just evolves over time, like in, like in any other area of the law. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear, hear, hear from, from Tom on this issue. You know, I, I can imagine a lot of very frustrated uh, technical people who've built great you know, what I would call sort of passive defense mechanisms. In other words, they built software that detects intrusions, that mitigates intrusions. You know, they built this, these technical layers, but through um, errors of human behavior, you know, the layers of protection that they've built essentially are thwarted because, you know, the classic example, you know, somebody clicks on a link you know, um, cause they want to see a, you know, a picture of a kitten and their social, you know, social media advertises they love kittens and they just can't help it when the link comes in. And so I wonder, you know, Kevin, when you're talking about how do we allocate those resources, you know, what are we going to spend money on passive s sort of technology and software or, or training humans to be more responsible, you know, with s some of these more like interactive, training programs and some red team kind of testing with a little bit of, you know, embarrassment or incentive. I, I, I wonder, Tom, if, if, if you think, you know, from what you've seen in the vulnerabilities, you know, where, where, where we should be focusing our attention, is it more on the latest technical answer or is it training, training up the staff? Uh, yeah, I, I think like always, it's going to be a little bit of both, but I really do think the, the training is paramount. It's uh, helping your employees not only understand what the threat environment is, which is what we've been talking about here today, but what to do when, when they see it. Uh, I know back when I was with the, a large Fortune 500 company, we spent a lot of time getting our employees trained on how to report suspicious activities. And what we found was it 
increased our detection time of anomalous activities on the network. When you have uh, a phishing campaign uh, targeting your employees, and yes, your uh, your technical defenses might catch 99% of everything coming through, but it still ends up with 100 people getting that email. It takes one person knowing how to report and get that where you can move into remediation and containment very quickly. So I really do think it's a, a combination of, of both where there's some technical controls, like as you said, where you want your uh, security stack to be working in the background and, and even your least cyber aware person should have some protections built in uh, to, to the, uh, the networks they're accessing. Uh, but then the education uh, aspect, I think, is paramount. Uh, so we always uh, stress the walking through those exercises, even the C-suite. We're seeing that um, the C-suite and, and the boards of directors are asking much smarter questions now about not only do we have backups on our systems, but how are we positioned? How would this play out? And we're seeing that even there, the training of the uh, senior executives has really improved not only the understanding of this threat environment, but then also when it comes to allocating necessary resources, once they understand, oh, wow, we, we actually do have a exigent threat to our, our business and we do need to handle this and they can make much smarter decisions once they better understand the threat that they're dealing with. So um, I think it's going to be a, a little bit of, of both as we move forward. You know, Seth, Tom mentioned again, education, training, you know, CEOs getting a little smarter about this, but it, you and I have talked about this before is, you know, from the perspective of the government, if you're the SEC or the Department of Justice, your Homeland Security, and you come in after an event or even before an event and an inspection, you know, how do you, how do you develop a metric? How do you demonstrate, Hey, I got a training program, right? Because everybody has a training program. You know, a lot of times it might be a check the box training program. Yeah, we have one, but how do you, have you seen anything or do you have any advice for the, you know, for the listening group here, how to demonstrate to the government that not only do I, we have a training program, but also it's pretty darn effective. And this is why, you know, is there a metric that you've seen in your experience, Seth, or do you have some thoughts about that? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, having been on both the receiving and giving end of these things that, you know, the, the ones that I would find most um, compelling. So if I were, you know, back in my government shoes and I was scrutinizing, what did somebody do? And was it reasonable and appropriate to meet the threat? I think the, the, the better companies now have um, uh, interactive training modules um, that require some uh, participation, you know, by the employee. So you're essentially navigating kind of a, a choose your own adventure. You know, this happens. What do you do? You know, to Tom's point about reporting phishing emails up through the system, you know, that alone in a scenario. You know, and really that's what I'm talking about. Interactive scenario based training modules, I think, are an effective teaching tool more than, you know, emailing somebody a PowerPoint and saying, you know, please email me back confirming that you received and read this PowerPoint, which, you know, that's one way to do this. I mean, there's, there's, there's folks who do that. But I, I think what I would consider to be the gold standard would be more of an, an interactive uh, training module that is appropriate for uh, the, the component or the, or the group, you know, or the employee to whom it is sent. And I think you could do that categorically. Maybe it's an all employee or maybe it's a specific employee, depending on what their responsibilities are in the network. But you have essentially the same interactive training module that goes to similarly situated people. And they do it and they are scored on it. And it, it essentially <laughs> forces them to a level of competence because, you know, unless you score, let's say, an 80 percent, you can't complete the project. Right. So you're going to get do overs until you are educated on what the process is. And I think ideally you do that frequently because people need reminders. I mean, these are this is not front of brain for people. They've got, you know, work to do and lives to lead and this is not going to be front of brain. So, you know, I don't, you know, for me I don't think annually is is probably ideal. I would want to do it probably more often than annually, but at least annually. And then you'd want to show that your training module is evolving with the nature of the threat. So you have to have, you know, someone like Tom keeping you so, you know, sophisticated enough so that you're not fighting 
you know, the last war. You know, you're not preparing to deal with the attacks of 2012. You're preparing to deal with the attacks of 2022. Gotcha. And then I think you document that. And then I think, you know, you test it with some of the red team exercises. So, you know, you have your folks go through the training module. Part of that maybe is to make them uh, more wary to phishing uh, emails and to make them report it. And then you red team it. You know, you send some segment of your uh, uh, team fake phishing emails and you see if they do what it is, <laughs> you know, they were trained to do. And then you record that. And if they don't, you remediate it and address it. Um, uh, or otherwise you're just documenting, you know, your, your, your own, um, vulnerabilities, which is not great, but, but I think that's, you know, and, and I, look, I'd be very curious to hear t Tom's answer on this. He, you know, he's the professional that deals with this on the front end, you know, Kevin, you and I are the ones who, 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 who try to, you know, clean up some of the litigation issues ideally in advance. But I would think that if we had a client who had done the things that I just said, and a plaintiff came in or a regulator or investigator came in and started making accusations of of negligence uh, that we'd, we, you know, or worse, uh, we'd be in a we'd be in a pretty good spot if we could demonstrate that level of attention to the problem. Yeah, Tom, I'd be interested in that response. I mean, about it, you know, summarizing what Seth was describing, maybe for our for our listeners, you know, it's it's a frequent scenario based interactive training program that's measured. And then those measurements are um, used to compare, the, you know, the employee's success in those uh, and and then come back with some additional tools. And I'll pause and sort of give you a chance to weigh in. And then maybe we can talk about two of those additional tools that have popped up a couple of times already today. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I think Seth um, got it right. Uh, it's the training and it's it's. Uh, seeing it's having also the right KPIs of what are you training for? It's not okay, necessarily so key, key performance indicator. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going all over acronyms. Uh, yeah, there we go. Yes. Um, it's having the right metrics in which you're trying to, uh, track. And it's not necessarily if an employee fails a test and clicks on the link because everyone, uh, happens. It's what do they do after that. Do they report once they clicked on a link? Uh, how, effective is it when people do detect a phishing link and report it those are the so it's measuring the right things because those are the things that you want to encourage your employees to do you want this to be not punitive you want this to be something where they feel like they're they're part of this and they're getting the the appropriate feedback and for us we've seen the most effective organizations which is where they shifted the the culture through the training to really help employees understand that this is not something to be uh, concerned. Well, it's not something that they need to be worried that there will be punitive actions taken against them if they get it wrong, but quite the opposite, which is we want that transparency. We want to foster that engagement. We want everyone to be hyper aware of security issues that pertain to the organization. And I think that's where the, the really effective training programs, that's what they uh, achieve in their outcomes. And I think, you know, we talked about red team, you know, and so Tom, maybe define red team for our audience and then maybe talk about tabletops. But I do want to come back to Seth before we finish today and uh, pick up on one more legal issue, but quickly define red teams and tabletops in the context of what we were describing. Sure. Uh, in the context of training and testing your systems with how well they would uh, detect and respond to an actual real world attack. Uh, there are what we call red teams where these are organizations outside where they will uh, use tools that are publicly available or commonly used and they'll actually try to penetrate your network. And what they're doing is they're uh, trying to test whether your, uh, whether your your technologies in place are detecting the right things, whether your incident responders are able to uh, track activities across the network. And it's really a, a, a good way to, to test your systems and validate that everything that you think is actually operating within your network is operating as it should be. And so at the end of that process, Tom, do people produce a report or some findings? Uh, quite often there's a report that comes with it about uh, how well the defenders were able to uh, detect the activities and it, it provides uh, different 
uh, remediation steps if there were areas where the red team was successful in the sense of they were successful in getting access to your network or taking information off of there. And it's one where, as Seth was talking about, this is quite often it's a way in which you just better understand how your organization defenses are operating. And it gives recommendations about how you can improve uh, those defenses as well. So, so Seth, that just scares the bejesus out of lawyers, right? Uh, so we've got this third party vendor who came in and did what was right, right? We tried yep. to make our organization better. But yep. then lo and behold, three years later, we have a cyber intrusion. We have a data breach. We have something in plaintiff's lawyers and the government. They want that report. They heard about it and they want it. Yep. Talk about the razor's edge that we walk with that report and what's the state of the law and stuff like that right now. Yeah, un unfortunately, that that razor got sharper uh, recently in, in terms of privilege and the privilege that can be asserted over the over the types of reports that you're talking about. Uh, Kevin, um, you know, look, the, the, <laughs> you, you're, you're conducting the exercise to see uh, whether or not your systems work in your employees' function. That's not necessarily the same reason that you're writing the report. And here's where it becomes critically important. A report, which is essentially um, at the direction of outside counsel for the purpose of preparing for litigation, uh, typically uh, is protected by privilege. A report that's put together for anything other than that is is probably not going to be. And and, and we've seen a, a couple of cases recently, as we we set out in a recent client alert about the privilege, where the, you know the, the court found that uh, these reports, uh, not even an exercise, but in response to an actual uh, incident. Uh, we're not privileged, even though uh, the consultant was retained by the outside counsel, because the you know the, the the main purpose of commissioning the report was not in preparation of litigation. So I, I think we can say, Kevin, you know, without being too cute, <laughs> you know, if you have a breach, there's going to be litigation concerns, and so if you're going to have a report generated that relates to that breach, or even an exercise relating to that breach, you should. Think about it in terms of preparing for that possibility of litigation. And you should ideally, if you want the protection of the privilege or the potential protection of the privilege, have your outside counsel hire the consultant to do the work and generate the report for that purpose. Um, or else, you know, uh, face the very real possibility that that report is going to fall in, into the hands of uh of plaintiff's attorneys, you know, at some point and, and may be used to compound, you know, the injury to you, uh, un unfortunately. So, um, you know, th the challenges here are preparing contemporaneously and kind of synergistically uh, for all of the potential injuries that could arise from a cyber incident. There's technical issues, the monetary issues, the reputational issues, you know, uh, and, and, the, and the legal issues. And, you know, if you're not thinking about these things, all of these things together and in advance, it's very hard to get it right, you know, when the, when the bad thing, when the bad thing happens. So that's, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a cautionary tale. I mean, the other client alert we had was the, you know, the SEC is, you know, held to companies accountable recently for cyber incidents and internal control failures. So there are, there's lots of ways, <laughs> you know, uh, to, to suffer injury as a result of these things. And the, and the best thing you can do is really just start thinking about it now and preparing these contemporaneous, what I would say, pillars of resistance, technical, legal, reputational. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> it's tough on these reports. You know, if there's a, regulatory requirement requiring an incident investigation. It's often the case that judges are just not going to say that that's protected. But if we're doing the first example we talked about on this call, which was sort of this red team analysis, this checking, you know, how good are we at something? You know, I think there's room there, but you got to do what you said, Seth. You got to follow the hygiene around setting that up. You got to have either your internal legal team or an external legal team contract with someone like Tom and their group to run that. And then it really, it's got to go through the lawyer back to the, ultimately to the business client, right? If it just in the problem with the, you know, with the one case from Pennsylvania, Seth, you were mentioning is that that was a little bit different. That was, you know, post an actual incident. 
And initially, I think if I remember right, it, it was between the outside consultant and the business unit. And then the lawyers got involved. And I think the judge picked up on that sort of that that delta. And it's a little different because, as you know, Seth, from being a prosecutor for so long, there's a difference between facts and, and, and communications. And, you know, we'll we'll beat on our briefcase as prosecutors all day long about, well, those are just facts. We des- we deserve those facts. And, and, you know, the reports have to be more than facts. They got to be opinions and whatnot. So it is it is tough. But I, that's one where I recommend, you know, to our audience, you know, go get some advice. Make sure that you're you know, chief information security officers and his or her staff are in conjunction with your legal team. So you can, you can approach that the right way. Well, I see in terms of time, we're pretty close to our 60 minutes. Um, Tom, any, any sort of concluding thoughts and Seth, I'll come back to you here in just a second, but you know, if you can give any message to our group, you know, we didn't get to talk specifically about a ransomware event. So if you want to take some time to talk about that, but, uh, but let's, let's give our final thoughts to our group. Uh, yeah, first of all, thanks for uh, having me here today. Uh, concluding thoughts, I participate in so many of these calls where when we're talking about cyber threats, it's very much doom and gloom. And, and every other day, there's a bigger headline of a bigger breach and a bigger impact stemming from some uh, cyber incident. And it really isn't all that doom and gloom. Uh, we spend a lot of our time in these areas so we can help people understand these threats. And I think this is, to me, the biggest change that we're seeing underway. It's the acknowledgement that this is a problem. It's the senior level executives that understand that adequate resources are needed to deal with this. It's uh, really, I think, changing the way organizations, uh, how they think about cyber events and how they're going to prepare. And I think as Seth was talking about uh, back in 2012, it was a very different environment. And I, I think that's right. Nowadays, I, I think everyone just acknowledges that this is something, cyber is something that everyone needs to uh, think about, you need to plan for. And the great part is there's a lot of tools, there's a lot of services, and there's a lot of ways in which you can really do that education and, and get this technology deployed in a thoughtful way. And I think that's the, the way out of this, which is helping people understand what those basics are. And then being proactive in, in how you monitor these. And I think that's one where, uh, from our perspective, we, we love it when none of our clients have any events and they don't need to call us because that means we're doing our job of, of being proactive and helping avert some of these uh, big events. And I, I think we are getting better at that, uh, despite all the headlines that you see. Seth, any, anything to add to that, for, particularly from a legal perspective? No, just I, I think it's a. I think Tom's message is a great one. You, you, you know, it, we can't be paralyzed by fear. We just can't. I mean, life is risky, but we need the room to innovate. You know, to to take risks. You know, to get out there, live, live our lives, and do our business. And there's a cloud of fear, I think, hanging over uh, a lot of a lot of folks now, corporations r- related to these types of attacks. And I think that's largely because there's an information gap between the reality of what happens and the fear of what happens. And so, you know, I think thanks to people like Tom, the more communication about what the actual threat is, what the nature of that threat is and how it can be mitigated is really important. And, and I think, Kevin, you know, as, as lawyers, we got to be lawyers who who help, you know, we got to be the lawyers, you know, who say how to do it, not not to do it. <laughs> right. So you've got to, there's always going to be some risk, you know, when you're out there in the world, when you have a, you know, when you have a website, when you communicate, when you have a network, when you have these platforms, all you can do is take reasonable measures, establish good habits, accept that you could do everything right and bad things can still happen to you. But, you know, you hopefully have the resilience to get, get through that and, and keep going. So while the, you know, while the landscape has certainly changed and it, it can be hostile, um, I think, you know, we're all collectively committed to finding a way to keep going, you know, through this landscape. And I, th- and I think it's doable. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, and just, you know, sharing this hour with the two of you, my, my two biggest takeaways from my perspective are um, one is coordination, right? You get, get your legal team, get your internal IT team, get your external vendors together and coordinate and, and sort of think through what those problems might be. And, you know, hopefully at least once a year, if not more often, participate in your own internal tabletop tabletop exercise. 
Um, it may be the case you're in a critical in, you know, industry and, and there are national tabletops that you can participate in, you know, for some of our people in our audience. And then I think the other thing, and this is really from, you know, Tom's company and, and similar companies is go on the, uh, go on the attack now. You know, you, there are tools that you can go out and you can find these bad guys and find what they're looking at. And you can sort of be more offensive, more proactive and less reactive. And, you know, I get the benefit of visiting with some uh, chief information security officers about four or five times a year at one of their forums. And, and I can tell over the years that's what's happening now. We, we've sort of moved from reactive to being more proactive. And so I think, I think for me, those were the takeaways. Coordinate and be proactive. Um, well, Tom and, and Seth, thank you so much for spending an hour with us. I hope our listening audience uh, found that to be useful. Uh, certainly, our contact information will be uh, with our podcast. And you can send out an email to Tom or Seth or me, for that matter, and, and, and follow up if you found something uh, interesting. We enjoyed you spending part of your day with us. Thank you.